Are you an Amazon Prime member? Do you have five minutes? Then you could support us with $5 a month for free. Head to escapeartists.net slash twitch for a complete walkthrough. Escape Pod, episode 928. Zerbulon Vance sings the alphabet songs of love by Mary Haskell. Flashback Friday. Hello, and welcome to Escape Pod, your weekly science fiction podcast. I'm Valerie Valdez, your host for this episode. Our story this week is a flashback from our vaults. Zebulon Vance Sings the Alphabet Songs of Love by Mary Haskell. This story originally appeared in Apex Magazine in February 2013. Mary Haskell was born in Michigan and grew up in North Carolina. She wrote her first story at the age of seven, and she walked to dogs after school in order to buy her first typewriter. Mary returned north to attend the Residential College of the University of Michigan, where she earned a BA in Biological Anthropology. Her fiction has appeared in Nature, Asimov Science Fiction, Strange Horizons, and Unplugged, the web's best sci-fi and fantasy, 2008. She now lives in Saline, Michigan, with her husband and stepdaughter. Mary works in a library with over 7 million books, and she finds this to be just about the right number. She is also the author of The Princess Curse and Handbook for Dragon Slayers. Our narrator, Amanda Ching, is a freelance editor and writer. Her work has appeared in Word Riot, Candlemark, and Gleam's Alice Revisions, and every bathroom stall on I-80 from Pittsburgh to Indianapolis. Now, get ready for Robot Ophelia to make her debut, or perhaps her curtain call because it's story time. Zebulon Vance Sings the Alphabet Songs of Love by Mary Haskell I am Robot Ophelia. I will not die for love tonight. The Noon Show is the three-hour 1858 Booth production. The most fashionable historical war remains the first American Civil. Whenever fact fans discover that Lincoln's assassin played Horatio, they simply must come and gawk at this titillating replica of their favorite villain playing no one's favorite character. Fact fans love authenticity. To the delight of robot Hamlet, today's clients insist that Edwin Booth stride the stage beside his more famous brother. Most performances, robot Hamlet remains unused in the charging closet, for the first law in our business is, everybody wants to play the Dane. Today, Robot Hamlet is afire with Edwin Booth's mad vigor and runs his improv algorithms at full throttle. He kisses me dreamily and rips my bodice in a way that would have never been allowed in Victorian America. The fact fans don't look hyper-pleased about this. It tarnishes their precious authenticity. Robot Horatio also loves the 1858 Booth. It's the only time anyone comes to the performance for him alone. But what about the rest of us, the remainder of the Autoglobe's incantation of robots? We bear with it as we bear with all other iterations of our native play. The fact fans barely notice me when either booth is on stage. I clutch my ripped bodice, exit robot Ophelia. I get me to a nunnery. Act 4, Scene 4 I wait for my cue and check the call sheet for the 6 o'clock show. My next casting is for an Ophelia in the style of a vapid pop princess who died 300 years ago. She was a terrible actress without a legacy, whose performance has been the low watermark for Ophelia's since first the play was the thing, and I can't even imagine what nostalgic hawk or handsaw has gotten up this customer's nose and made him choose that performance out of all the options on the menu. I've wondered, but never asked, why that performance is even in my repertoire. I see no merit in a plastic recitation of the lines I've spoken 1,168 times in the last year alone. No merit in wearing my hair perfectly combed during my madness. No merit in keeping my face expressionless in the way that was fashionable in 21st century New York, when even the youngest of women injected botulinum toxin into their facial muscles. Why recreate something that no one really missed in the end? 
Scene five is here. My cue is coming. I sway onto center stage to deliver my rosemary and my remembrance. When I return to the wings, I lie down to die. This is the indignity of Ophelia. I die for love, and yet my death is an afterthought, recited by the queen and rarely staged. Your sister drowned, Laertes. I cross my hands over my heart, waiting to be carried on stage for the showing. No one needs me except in body. My thoughts are my own, and I am dreading six o'clock. The next show is no act of avant-garde genius. It's a straightforward reenactment of something dull and sad. It's an indulgence in some artless cretin's obsessive fantasy with a woman who paid for her fame by dying young after living tackily. That is when I know I will not die for love tonight. I uncross my decorously folded hands. I get up. The play goes on in the background, the words slinking over my interlink from the autoglobe's other robots. I walk down to wardrobe and head for Hamlet's closet. Ophelia's clothes are always too young, too innocent, too girly, even in the most stylistic iterations. I have no Valkyrie Ophelia on file. I search through Hamlet's melancholy colors for a modern ensemble and find a reasonable approximation of current streetwear. Wasp-waisted schleather jacket, skin-tight schlick t-shirt, silk pantaloons of bamboo, shining boots. All in black and white, of course. No one dresses Hamlet in pink or green. Not more than once a century, anyway. For my face, I adjust the metal and plastic scaffolding beneath my chromatic skin into the shape of my favorite, a young Helen Mirren. It is an obscure choice, though I choose a darker complexion over her outmoded pinkness. And then I walk straight out the front doors of the theater. The autoglobe is never locked from the inside. No one thought the robots would ever want to leave. I am Robot Ophelia, and I will not die for love tonight. The autoglobe is on the edge of the entertainment district. My interlinked to the other robots dies away behind me. We were only on internal house wireless, not sinking via the ether. I am, for the first time since I was shipped, alone. A robot without an incantation. I stride quickly through the ringing lights of Vega Prime Sixes, casinos, and cabarets, walking to I know not where. I am free. It is novel and exciting, this freedom. I did not die for love tonight. I will not die again for love. I have abandoned a show in the midst of Act Four, Scene Seven. I have abandoned the six o'clock customer and the paltry Ophelia he wants to wring from me, too. Why? How? As important as they are, I push those questions away. I don't seem to want to question my impulses while in the throes of them. I'd make a fine alcoholic if I had a digestive system and a liver to steer her by. I stroll the vermilion strip where neon dims the glory of the galaxy above and turns the sky ruddy black. Everywhere there are signs for shows, magic, song, dance, lookalikes. The impersonators attract me most, perhaps because I am an impersonator myself. The Divine Sarah's Variety Show, the voice of Billie Holiday, an all-star tribute to Amitabh Bakchan, the famous faces of the first colony, Elvis and Lisa Marie's Everlasting Christmas. I creep a little further down the street, and there, in a tidy, marbleanium palace at the end, I find Zebulon Vance sings the alphabet songs of love. I charge a ticket to the Autoglobe's accounts and go in. The show is in progress. Zebulon Vance stands in white velvet dripping with crystals in the center spotlight. Holographic projections of the letters of the alphabet dance in the air beside him as he sings their verse. R's for the roses, the roses of romance, and the rigor mortis of the rod in my pants. It's hypnotic and awful, and I regret that I have developed any sense of aesthetics at all. I sit through the remaining letters and the finale and the encore, numb by the awfulness, waiting until the crowd of fans disperses. Only then do I approach, pinging him softly, robot to robot. Nothing answers me except the tiny ether chip embedded in their gray meat that all humans implant to assist them with mental interlinks. He is not a robot. Shocked, I speak. Mr. Vance? He turns and smiles at me, the skin near his eyes crinkling softly. Not old age crinkles, just human skin crinkles. Oh, 
another fan. I thought you had all gone. Not so much a fan, sir, if you'll excuse me, I say, hesitant because I don't actually know how to talk to humans outside of my prescribed roles. I do interact with people beyond the stage. Robot Ophelia is not simply Ophelia. She is also the actress who plays Ophelia. This usually only comes into play when the actors who play Hamlet, or sometimes even a deviant Polonius or Laertes, feel that the acting experience isn't complete without having sexual intercourse with the ingenue. But the illusion of my existence has heretofore always ended at the doors of the autoglobe. Outside those doors, I am neither pretending to be Ophelia nor the actress who plays Ophelia, and I don't know who to pretend to be now. You're not a fan? Zebulon Vance frowns, dark eyes confused, maybe even sad. I, I'm an impersonator of a sort, like you, sir. I was wondering if you had some advice for me. And Zebulon Vance smiles, and I see why thousands have swooned for this man. My curiosity is piqued. How can a human being do such a perfect impersonation? How can he not be Robot Zebulon? Only the human safety governors in my program keep me from peeling back Zebulon Vance's skin to make sure there are no facial struts behind that smile. My dear girl, he says, I am no impersonator. I am the real Zebulon Vance. How could the real Zebulon Vance be here? The Vermilion Strip is all impersonators and robots. I think that probably tells you more about the fame of Zebulon Vance than anything else. The modern Zebulon Vance, of course. I summon a small flood of information from the ether and learn that this man's parents were fact fans who named their son after a post-Confederate politician, a contemporary of the Booths. Zebulon Baird Vance, who once said, The purpose of war is to explore each other. He was also famous for paying $100 to anyone who named a child after him. This Zebulon Vance was, then, the ultimate fact fan inside joke. By the time my namesake was my age, he says, he was beloved by far more than just a few middle-aged women trying to recapture their youths. Not that I don't love them. They keep me in white velvet, don't they? This man is either the real Zebulon Vance or the most convinced and convincing impersonator in the galaxy, and his gaze is nearly misty when he says, But then again, perhaps I am an impersonator, an impersonator of my childish self. Who's to say any more? And you had an acting question for me, my dear? What is your name? I... I... I stutter, lost in a loop, trying to discover a program inside of me that knows how to lie. But I don't know how to lie, only how to impersonate. I don't have a name, I say at last. But I think of myself as Robot Ophelia. I... Work, live, exist, belong to... And from the Autoglobe... Zebulon Vance's expression morphs into astonishment. You're a robot? A sitter? Sitter stands for Self-Insertion Theatrics Automaton. Yes. I'm inexpressibly relieved. He understands. My dear girl, he says kindly, let me buy you some pie. Zebulon Vance takes me to a clean, well-lighted diner down a dark alley. I sit with folded hands while he sips coffee and eats schmeatloaf sandwiches and cherry pie. Are you sure you don't want something? I could ingest food if it would make you feel better. I have the capacity, but I would just have to excrete it undigested later. I make a gesture, tracing the path of the food down to my stomach pouch, then back up through my mouth again. Never mind, then. He tries to make me comfortable. We talk about the author and the play for a golden hour before he asks me how I came to leave the autoglobe. I do not know how to tell him that I did not want to die again, off stage, however poetically reported. So I tell him about the six o'clock show, and how I don't want to play the version of Ophelia that the dead singer created three hundred years ago. And that's why you're here? he asks. You don't want to play this version of Ophelia because this other woman's performance is so poor you don't want to replicate it? I have no honor for that performance or that performer. Zebulon Vance smiles and his face dimples. I know dimples signify a gap in the facial musculature and I shift my strut slightly to make a similar dimple on my own cheek. Zebulon Vance's eyes track the movements, but I don't think he understands what I've done. He frowns uncomfortably, revealing a new dimple. I do not replicate this one. 
He coughs slightly and looks down, speaking as a real person who is much replicated. He points to an ad for a tribute to the stars of Vega on the placemat, and there is a thumbnail picture of a ten-year-old Zebulon Vance look-alike, mouth wide and singing, and much talked about. Let me caution you against operating on assumptions. What everybody knows is never the truth. Everybody knows I was a child star, that my parents stole my money, that I never had a girlfriend until I was 23. Everybody knows I'm stupid, venial, write bad songs, that I'm depressed, that I'm addicted to drugs, that I sold my kidney, that I'm moving to earth, that I can't afford to move to earth. Everybody knows, and nobody knows. The truth is, I'm happy, Robot Ophelia. My parents didn't steal my money, they just weren't great at managing it, and it was gone by the time I turned 18. And yeah, the first time I had a girlfriend, I was 23, but I'd had boyfriends before that, plenty of them. I've enjoyed a few drugs, recreationally, and I did give my kidney to my dying cousin, and that same cousin supported me when my money dried up. And sure, I write bad songs, but it's not like I think they're good, I just know that they'll sell. I felt love, and I've been loved, Robotophilia, and for everything that everybody knows, I know something about myself that nobody knows. When you think about this performance you're supposed to give, this Ophelia that is the worst version of Ophelia in the galaxy, why don't you look past what everybody knows and maybe get inside that dead woman's head? Maybe it will be worth doing after all. He has astonished me, and I usually have processing cycles to spare. I think about this, digest it, and before he takes a second breath, I reply, But that was just the beginning, Mr. Vance. The performance request made me pause, but in the pause is when I decided. I no longer wish to go mad and die for love. Zebulon Vance stares at me. He reaches across the table, takes my hand. My dear girl, everybody knows Ophelia dies for love. Unprogrammed tears leak from my eyes, emptying the lacrimal reservoir that was supposed to last through the six o'clock performance. I watch him through teardrops caught in my lashes, a refracted man in white velvet. A shadow falls across our table, cast by a man with a small animated goat singing silently above his breast pocket, the logo of Dionysus Automatons. One of them, a tech, not a programmer, but one of them nonetheless. I wondered when you'd catch up with her, Zebulon Vance says. He sounds sad. The show must go on, the text says significantly. I blink at him, stand up, and shake myself, prepared now to return to the theater. The text says to Zebulon Vance, that's the reset sequence if she comes back. Just say that, and you'll send her on her way. Oh, dear, says Zebulon Vance. Is it likely she'll show up again? Didn't you just wipe her memory? An acting robot learns from experience. Wiping her memory would be like wiping a human's memory. We don't know what cascades we might trigger, and it would render her temporarily useless. Any relearning would be costly, and there's no understudy for robots. All I did was reinforce her duty protocols. Oh, is that all? Performance Log, The Autoglobe, Vermilion Springs, Vega Prime 6. Performance 73D-614, Ophelia 95-KJ. Robot Ophelia knows Rosemary is for remembrance, and she also knows she'd sink very easily to the bottom of any swamp, mill pond, or stream that she might choose to throw herself into. But she also knows that Rosemary is merely a symbol for remembrance, and it's a type of metadata close to her and cannot lead her down memory pathways to some greater truth about life and death and the rest of it. Nor will it allow her access to the sunlit daydream where she is the girl and Hamlet is the boy and there's nothing but skin and blood and bone between their hearts. Robot Ophelia thinks maybe she really was a girl once, but she doesn't know why. Her programming commands tears to come. If she could just show everyone that the tears come of their own accord every time her heart breaks, that would be something. But the audiences and the actors always assume that she is just a vessel for another's vision, weeping on cue at the direction of amateurs. Come, my coach. Good night, ladies. Good night. 
The Auto Globe covered for the absence of my dead body with the booth performance, but had to refund the disgruntled six o'clock Hamlet's money when I disappeared. Mr. Six O'Clock doesn't rebook for his fetish performance with Ophelia the plastic pop star from centuries past. The 614th performance of Fiscal Year 73D ends up being a rather trite rehash of a recent film release, something run-of-the-mill with me in long braids, and it's our last performance of the evening. None of the other robots acknowledges that I went missing during the last play, nor that I missed the six o'clock, neither do they comment on my return. They program us to be social on demand, but we lack the impulse, the millions of years of genetic training through co-grooming, food sharing, one of the many little traits humans take for granted that even monkeys possess and robots do not. Robot Hamlet is downloading performance notes from Centauri's Swan Song Theater, and the others perform similar tasks, honing their crafts. I'm supposed to be doing the same, but I wonder... Do any of them feel as disgusted with their tragic deaths as I feel with mine? The ones who die on stage seem to relish it. The ones who shuffle off stage to die like me, Rosencrantz, Guildenstern, do they care? I think about pinging them to ask, but there is an outside request to download my night's performance notes. I send them along before I notice that it's not a planet-to-planet -planet request. Someone else on Vega Prime 6 wants them. That's odd. Only Ophelia's ever request my notes, and there are no other Hamlet houses in the Vegas system. I think about leaving again. I think about walking out the door and going to the next performance of The Alphabet Songs of Love. My newly reinforced duty protocols say that's okay, since I won't miss Curtin. I wonder if that's true, though. I wonder if I'll be sitting in a diner with Zebulon Vance, and a man with a singing goat over his heart will come to find me again, and this time he won't just be content with a verbal override. What if he opens up my chest right there in the diner and starts mucking around in my brain? Even worse, what if Zebulon Vance says the magic words and sends me back across the rainbow to die for love alone off stage again? A few minutes after that, long enough for a human to assimilate my performance notes, I have a private message from Zebulon Vance. May I visit you? Confused, I reply in the affirmative. I'm here already, he tells me. I run to the entrance and let him into the theater, and his arms are around me and mine are around him, and I have never noticed before the pleasure that sings in my censers when someone touches me. This is strange, I tell him. My whole life has been strange, he says, and he seems to be answering questions that hasn't even occurred to me to ask. For me, what's another tabloid that speculates about my girlfriend? I don't know, I say, because I don't. I think he interprets the words as some sort of reluctance, because he says, And has your life up to now been normal? I am not alive. I don't have a life. No, that's not true. You grow, you're changing, right before my very eyes. I'm not changing. Am I changing? He puts his hands on my shoulders and looks into my optics. The show must go on. I frown at him, but he smiles. Doesn't that make you want to go do things? A little, but only because I have to. Congratulations. You've learned guilt. I consider this. I consider the impulse that he has provoked in me, how it wants to control me, but can't. I'm changing, I whisper, but I don't know why or how. He pulls me close again. I know how. Think about it. Consider your collective noun. My collective noun. A herd of deer, a pod of dolphins, a stack of librarians, an incantation of robots. I say, finally understanding what he is saying. And why do they call you that? I summon the definition from the ether. An incantation is a spell or charm to produce a magic effect, chosen because any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I quote, Magic, he laughs. I think it must be a registered category of insanity to throw Shakespeare into the stars and expect nothing weird to happen. Dousing an artificial intelligence in the greatest of literature, then teaching it, however much by rote, one of the greatest human arts? How could they not see you coming? There is no such thing as magic, not even in the theater, I say. 
and the author was a writer, not a god. I am very clear on this, if nothing else. There are more things in heaven and earth, Ophelia, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Don't. Don't quote that. Never quote that. Nor misquote it. Teach me something else. Anything else. Another play. No. Better. Buy me a novel. Something in the public domain, then? Perhaps Jane Austen. We won't have credit for new novels for a while, I'm afraid. It's going to cost me everything I own and then some to pay for your replacement here, so that their damn show can go on. I struggle to answer, to understand him, but he's gazing into my eyes and I into his, and it is impossible for me to look away. His eyes are moist, gelatinous, beautiful. There are tiny worms of pink veins reaching for oxygen in his sclera, and his pupils shift in dimension, grasping for light. I've looked into the eyes of a thousand hamlets and remained unmoved, but staring into Zebulon Vance's eyes, I'm overcome. I'm... I... My voice dies away. I don't know what to ask for, what to reveal. You are Robot Ophelia, he tells me. You are the girl, and I am the boy, and you know things about yourself that nobody knows. He kisses me. I kiss him back. Yes, I think. Yes, I know things. One thing. I am Robot Ophelia, and I will never die for love again. Once again, that was Zebulon Vance Sings the Alphabet Songs of Love by Mary Haskell. It's always incredible to come across a decade-old story that's prescient about current society and events in specific ways. Deepfakes and celebrity AI impersonations are proliferating now, some far more malicious than others, and we can only speculate as to what the future will hold in the near and far term for these technologies. Being able to order up a specific performance on demand, as presented in this story, feels like one such possible feature. Most fascinating for its use of live theater rather than mere videos, holograms, or similar less tangible representations. While the protagonist of this story is a robot, her shared experience with a real actor is, to paraphrase Terry Pratchett, where the falling human meets the rising machine. Humans need fantasy to be human. And perhaps, so do robots. Escape Pod is part of the Escape Artist Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit. And this episode is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. Don't change it, don't sell it, please do share it. If you'd like to support Escape Pod, please rate or review us on Spotify. Apple Podcasts, or your favorite app. We are 100% audience supported, and we count on your donations to keep the lights on and the servers humming. You can now donate via four different platforms. On Patreon and Ko-fi, search for Escape Artists. On Twitch and YouTube, we're at EA Podcasts. You can also use PayPal through our website, escapepod.org. Patreon subscribers have access to exclusive merchandise and can be automatically added to our Discord where they can chat with other fans, as well as our staff members. Our opening and closing music is by Daikaiju at daikaiju.org. And our closing quotation this week is from Carl Chopek's R.U.R. Do you think that the soul first shows itself by a gnashing of teeth? Thanks for joining us, and may your escape pod be fully stocked with stories. Stories.